Say I gave you two options in life. Which one would you choose? Option one, 25 years to life in prison for sending a member of Las Vegas royalty to the upper room and then trying to steal all of the silver out of his secret underground vault. Or option two, you can be the president of a company that's a state-of-the-art crypto mining company worth $1.9 billion. Well, here's a story about a man named Rick Tavish, who amazingly, unbelievably, has done both of these things in his life. This is who I was, but it's definitely not who I am. Welcome to Vegas Profile Stories. Let's get it. January 6, 1997, Las Vegas, Nevada. Herbert Fat Herbie Blitzstein, well, he's sent to the upper room by two men who are waiting outside of his Las Vegas townhome. Fat Herbie, he's a known mobster in Las Vegas. Most infamously, Fat Herbie was a lieutenant for Tony the Ant Spilatro. You guys might remember him, Joe Pesci played him in the movie Casino. Real wild man out there doing gem heist, all that. Well, Fat Herbie, that was his right hand man. Fast forward one year, 1998, Las Vegas, Nevada. Teddy Binion is the heir to the Binion dynasty in Las Vegas. With ownership in hotels like the Horseshoe, this guy's flamboyant, but why shouldn't he be? He's rich, he's relatively young, he's not married. What else is there to do? It's Las Vegas. Teddy, he was all about that life. He wanted the whole Vegas experience. Rumor was, Teddy was chasing the dragon. He had himself a little H habit. Now add to that, that Teddy is well-known friends with Fat Herbie? Well, the gaming board came down on Teddy Binion. Teddy had even gone out and shaved every hair on his body just to avoid a drug test from the gaming commission. Finally, they had had enough. They had heard about his illicit medicine habit, his ties to mobsters. They took his gaming license. Now, it's not like Teddy was some sort of real life junkie that was just following in his father's footsteps. You know, one of them spoiled kids. Teddy was built for the casino life. The dude could just spot a cheat from a mile away. He could do mathematical odds in his head, do things to really make the casino better. The dude was like a casino savant, basically. He just liked to get high a little bit, live that playboy life. July, 1998, Sandy Valley, Nevada. So just outside of Las Vegas, there's this little podunk town, we'll just call it that, called Sandy Valley, Nevada. Now, I'm not saying everybody in Sandy Valley manufactures clear illicit medicines. I'm just saying, if you want that type of thing, Sandy Valley is the place to go. There's a ton of labs out there. It's a well-known fact. So the other type of business that goes on in Sandy Valley is mining, gravel and sand mines, basically. So in 1998, two gravel pit owners, gravel and sand pit, whatever, they get into this little altercation. Now, none of the cops are called, nothing like that. Whatever happened, happened. Somebody signed over the business to the other one. And that was it. It was a, a moot point from then on. One of those men happened to be Rick Tavish. So around the same time, Rick had come down from Montana. He's successful in his own head, even though he hasn't made it big yet. So he goes and he hangs out where he knows rich people hang out at this club. He actually meets Ted Binion in the bathroom of all places. Soon enough, Rick meets Sandy. Sandy is the 26 year old girlfriend of 55 year old Teddy Binion. She lives with Teddy. I don't know if it's true love. I don't know. I'm not going to say that it isn't. I'm just saying that's a nice little lifestyle to be living. So shortly after meeting Sandy, Rick, he notices. He notices Teddy is kind of rude to her all the time, kind of pushing her off to the side, blah, blah, blah. He's steadily kind of falling in love with Sandy. He shoots his shot. They start to get together. He says, let me show you my mind shaft, pun intended. Do something about that, YouTube. So the two youngsters, they start having rendezvous. Now, in the meantime, the relationship between Ted and Sandy, well, it's, it's off and on. It's hot and cold. They're fighting. They're in love. It just is what it is. That tends to happen in a Las Vegas relationship when there's illicit medicine, when there's money, when there's all types of craziness going on. There's a huge age gap. It's going to happen. So apparently Teddy Binion gets a hold of his attorney. He says, I'm writing her out of my will. Now, the reason why he did this is he had hired himself a private investigator. That PI followed Sandy, obviously, to a hotel where she met up with Rick. Bing, bang, boom. 
you're out of the wheel. I don't ever want to see you again. So according to Sandy, that was the only time that they had ever met to do anything like this. This was the first and only time. And according to Rick, he was friends with Teddy. It just so happened that she was around. He saw that she was being, I, I don't want to say mistreated, but mistreated. Captain Save da -dun -da -dun, came on in. Hey, man, I'll take that if you don't want it. September 17th, 1998, Las Vegas, Nevada. Sandy finds 55-year-old Teddy Binion unresponsive on the floor in his mansion. Next to him were Zanny prescription bottles and paraphernalia for chasing the dragon. The cops come, they do a whole investigation. Detectives all through the house looking at this, looking at that. They rule it an OD and everybody moves on with their life. Teddy Binion had consumed too many illicit medications together and it costed him everything. September 19th, 1998, Pahrump, Nevada, 36 hours after Teddy Binion's demise. Ted Binion's secret vault in Pahrump, Nevada was raided of between seven and $14 million. Now Nye County is where this happened, not Clark County where Las Vegas is. Pahrump is in Nye County. Nye County sheriffs show up. It's the middle of the night. They find Rick with heavy equipment digging up this vault, opening the vault. So of course they arrest Rick. Hey, what are you doing out here? Teddy just died. Put these cuffs on, we're going to jail, talk about it. But the reason he knew about the vault was because he built it. And Teddy and Rick were the only two people who had the combination to the vault. Now Rick did call the Nye County Sheriff and say that he was going to be out there digging. That actually happened. The Sheriff said it to his deputies and then all of a sudden he retracted it. No, there was no phone call. Rick called them and said he would be out there. When asked why he was out there, Rick stated that Teddy had told him, I need you, if anything happens to me, go dig that all up, cash it in and give it to my daughter. So this is happening and the family, the Binion family, they're starting to cut Sandy out of the will. Now, initially Sandy was given her portion of the $50 million estate when Binion passed away. But then the family, they decided we're gonna take this all the way to the Nevada Supreme Court to get that shut down. At the same time, the Binions, they go out and they hire themselves their own private investigator. We're gonna dig into Sandy's lives and Rick's lives we're gonna figure out what's going on here. As the PI started to dig, they found out that Rick, coming from Montana, had a little bit of a shaky past in Montana. He had an illicit medicines charge, which ain't nothing. Everybody, when they're young, they get caught with a little bit of something they're not supposed to have. Then they found out that he had also been arrested for stealing a painting that he thought was worth $300,000 out of his lawyer's office. Now, it turned out that the painting was a counterfeit but he was still charged with the theft of this painting. This is when they also found out that the two were having an ongoing relationship and that Rick was married with two kids. Now, using the information that they had gathered through this PI, the Binion family parlayed that to the Clark County District Attorney's Office and got them to actually charge Rick and Sandy for the death of Teddy Binion. On that case was DA David Roger. Now this absurd little troll of a DA, he has made a career on convicting people on cases that have little to no evidence. This kind of guy, he doesn't care about what's right. He only cares about his legacy. He only cares about winning. It's almost like a game to him, right? If he wins or he loses, it's no real, real life consequences for this man. But when he wins, the real life consequences for the people that he convicts are monstrous. They're huge consequences. We're talking lifetimes taken. So the case comes across his desk. It's time to go ahead and take only the smut that they have from this Binion family PI and turn that into charges for first degree murder and the theft of the silver. Now, never mind that they had zero physical evidence whatsoever showing that Teddy Binion had died from anything else but an OD. Zero physical evidence. Never mind that the silver vault was in a different county and not even in David Rogers' jurisdiction. David Roger is prosecuting them in Clark County for a theft that happened in Nye County. None of this matters when Clark County wants to make a point out of you. Now they also added in the little incident that happened in Sandy Valley. 
between Rick and his business partner. See, his business partner saw this as the time to go in for the kill on Rick, I'm guessing. Now, whatever happened between them wasn't any type of public knowledge or the cops came or none of that. All of a sudden, Rick's facing these murder charges. Hey man, this dude extorted, kidnapped me, beat me with a phone book, and made me sign over my portion of the ownership of this, this pit. Now, I'm not saying that it did or did not happen to this man. I'm just saying that the timing of it is a little bit convenient. June 24th, 1999, Las Vegas, Nevada. Police formally arrest and charge Sandy and Rick for the death of Teddy Binion and the theft of his silver in Pahrump. And David Roger immediately goes into the media and he starts telling anybody who will listen how terrible this couple is and they would stop at nothing to gain all the wealth from Teddy Binion and they ended that man just for the money. Well, Sandy Murphy, she's not just sitting back. John Momet comes along. John Momet is a well-known mob lawyer. He actually represented Fat Herbie, Tony the Ant Spilatro, and now he's gonna be on her case. John Momet actually played himself in the movie Casino. It's pretty dope. So the judge in this case, well, it's legendary district court judge from Clark County, Joseph Bonaventure. Now I've been in front of Joe Bonaventure a couple of times down in the dungeon for the arraignments of district court. Being in front of that man, I'll say he's a decent person. He doesn't take his job like, like he's God. He treats people with respect. He's very thorough. He cares about the law. I've seen way worse judges. I mean, Judge Nancy Glass. See you next Tuesday, Nancy Glass. March 27, 2000, the Clark County Courthouse in Las Vegas, Nevada. The trial of the century for Vegas, at least, gets underway. David Roger is smutting up Sandy, saying she's a gold digger and blah, blah, blah. Smutting up Rick Tavis, saying that he's out here trying to rule the gravel and sand pit world and all kinds of, you know, just bad people, bad, bad, bad. So the state lays out this case. They said, hey, they force fed the dragon and Zannies to Ted Binion. And that's how, that's how he got sent to the upper room. Then if it wasn't enough, they changed that and said that no, they suffocated him, but they didn't suffocate him in such a way that would show any type of marks. Oh no, it was this super secret ninja that only villagers from Belize know about like from the 18th century type of, type of act. Now, what's more likely, what's most likely is Teddy Binion OD'd. Rick and Sandy, who had been having an affair, said, hey, all that silver sitting up there, we should probably go get rich. I would have done the same thing. So I can't hate on them. Is it being a bad person? Of course it is. Call me a bad person. In 1998, if I'd have had access to tractors and known where that was, there would have been two Ricks charged with the death of Ted Binion in this case because I would have been racing the other Rick to try and get this silver. Better believe it. There's zero chance I'm leaving seven to $14 million worth of silver alone if I know the person that owns it is in the upper room. I'm gonna need all of that, I'm coming for it. So the prelim comes up. The preliminary hearings, they usually take, they've taken me two minutes basically. That's about how long they usually take. This preliminary hearing took 13 days. So Rick and Sandy, they're smiling at each other in court. She's giving him googly eyes, you know, they're, they're upbeat, right? Now, a lot of people see that as being cocky, like they're stone cold killers or something, right? A lot of other people see it as they're relaxed because they know they have nothing to worry about because there's zero evidence that they did this and they actually know they did not do this. If I'm ever in a trial this big and I know for a fact there's zero evidence against me because I did not do it, I'm gonna be the most obnoxious. It's gonna be bad. People are gonna look at me like, damn, this dude's a sociopath or he's not guilty, one or the other. There is zero chance. I, I will laugh at everything that they say because it's not true. Now, like I said, originally David Rogers said that the amount of substance in Teddy Binion's body at the time was enough to kill four horses. Basically, he's saying that it was impossible for him to ingest that much that he must have been force fed it. Now, of course, this is until the state went and they paid to get the best known expert, Dr. David Bodden. 
Now, Dr. Bodden, he laid it all out. He says, look, those were rookie numbers when it comes to the substances in his body. Nothing like that would have taken him out. That's why they had to have suffocated him. But they did it in such a way that the capillaries in the eyes weren't circular. They were, there's only one way and it's an 18th century way. And he's saying that that's how they did it. That's the only way this could have happened. So that's the new theory. David Rogers just changing lanes. It doesn't matter. He's going 100 miles an hour. He's not putting his blinker on. Now to counter this, the defense, John Mommett, they bring in two of their own expert witnesses. The problem with these expert witnesses were they were kind of brash. They would kind of talk a little bit of shit about Baden and say he doesn't know what he's talking about. And their whole way of talking was like Italian, New Yorker, get out of here type stuff, right? One was from Philly, I think, or, or Pittsburgh. And he, he was all about being Pittsburgh. Then, of course, Teddy Binion's daughter hits the stand, pointing at her former almost stepmom, saying, oh, she was horrible. She yelled at me. She threatened to hurt me all the time. And, I mean, never mind that they were about the same age. No, don't even worry about that. Never mind that the daughter's probably like, what are you doing my dad, gold digger? And she's like, hey, get lost, little brat. I'm just, I'm paraphrasing here. I don't really know. Allegedly, allegedly. Then comes this little weirdo from Montana. Well, he hits the stand. He says, hey, I've been Rick's friend my whole life, our whole lives. Rick tried to pay me to off Teddy Binion. Said he would give me money. No, I turned him down. There's no way I would do that. Now, don't forget that the Binion family is handsomely rewarding anybody who comes forward with information that convicts Rick and Sandy. I'm not saying that his palms were greased. I'm saying it's very convenient. This reward starts floating around and guess what? Oh man, yeah. he told me he killed JFK too. Yeah, man, yeah, crazy. Then they get Rick's ex-business partner on the stand. That's not the end of the world. It's basically a he said, she said, or he said, he said type of deal. And it's all gonna come down to who the jurors believe, right? When it comes to Baden and the other two experts, who do they believe? Who do they like more? When it comes to Rick or his business partner, who do they like more? That's, that's what this is coming down to a popularity contest. All the while, there is zero real evidence. Now this ex-business partner gets on the stand and says that Rick locked him in the office and walloped him with a phone book. And if you're too young to know what a phone book is, this is a phone book. They used to put everybody's number in it, throw it and hit your door and wake up the whole neighborhood hitting doors. Big, heavy, lumberous. He said he went to work on him with the phone book until he agreed to sign over his portion of ownership of the gravel and sand mine. Now John Mommett, being John Mommett, he actually fought to be able to whack Rick Tavish on the stand in open court with a phone book to show that it would leave marks. Because this man was saying, no, it doesn't leave marks. That's why he did it. John Mama's like, well, let's, let's test this out. Hold on. You said what? Now, of course, Judge Bonaventure is not going to let it turn into a circus. But that's the type of dude John Mama was. God bless him. What an awesome dude. I want a lawyer that's gonna wanna whack me with a phone book in open court, in front of jurors and everything. That's the kind of lawyer I want. Now, just in case you've tuned out from information overload or whatever, I need you to come back. Come back, listen to this. During the middle of this court trial, this six week trial, 11 psychics showed up on the courthouse steps and did a seance to try and ask Teddy Binion how he, uh moved on to the next realm. Now here's the other thing. The jurors were never sequestered in this case. This big of a case and the jurors are going home. They're saying, hey man, I promise, I, I pinky swear, I will not watch the news, I will not read newspapers and I will not listen or talk about this case whatsoever. I won't listen to the morning radio on my way into court. I promise. So, Super promise, all right? Decoder ring promise. Are you kidding me? Now, Judge Bonaventure, who, like I said, is a great judge, this is his only mistake. Like, what are you talking about? This is the crime of a century in Las Vegas. Pretty much safe to say, hey, you should probably lock those 12 people into a hotel for six weeks, 
so they can't talk to the outside world. That's kind of the point. He didn't do that though. So after six weeks, it goes to the jury. Eight days, eight days the jury deliberated. What that tells me is there was at least one or two holdouts that are saying, no, they're not guilty of causing Teddy Binion to go to the upper room. They're saying, no, I, I will not convict them on that. There's just not enough evidence. For eight days, the rest of the jurors, well, they poked and prodded. Finally, those one or two jurors, they, they gave in. They didn't have the heart. They were cowardly. And they said, oh, fuck it. They're guilty, whatever. What's it matter? I want to go home. I want to be able to watch the news without reporting that I hadn't watched the news today. So these 12 jurors, they come back. David Roger actually found 12 dump trucks to be the jury. Now, I'm not quite sure how these jurors made it to court without driving off the road or falling in a hole or walking into light poles or something, but they did. They managed. They actually convicted Rick and Sandy, these Neanderthals. They convicted them of all the charges. Now, of course, they stole the silver or tried to steal the silver. Like, that's not really in contest. I mean, it is for Sandy, but not really Rick. You were down there with a the tractor digging it up. I mean, that's as red-handed as you could ever get caught. Did Teddy Binion in some sort of a high stupor tell him to do that? I'm sure that could have happened too, very easily. Euphoria is a bitch. Chalk it up for those, right? Chalk it up for, for the theft charges. But murder? Convicting in the death of somebody who was originally an OD case? Hopefully you guys just sit there and you go, man, what did I do to these people? Now, Rick was sentenced in this case. He got 20 to life for the first degree murder. Then for the sand mine kidnapping and extortion, he was given an aggregate of like 10 to 15 years. Now this, like I said, was kidnapping, extortion, robbery, all these bad charges. Then after that one was done, then he was to move on to his consecutive sentence for the Perump Silver Vault heist. Now in that one, he was given like a one to 10 and a one and a half to 10 to run concurrent, but consecutive to the others. I mean, mumbo jumbo, right? Basically he got 25 to life in aggregate of this case. The soonest Rick was eligible for parole in this case, he'd be almost 60 years old. Now, Sandy, being a woman, didn't matter in this one. This is one of the rare times where they came after her just as hard. They found her guilty and everything. She got 22 to life. Now, just to break it down, the two guys that were caught in Pahrump digging up the silver mine with Rick, and the two guys that went into this office at the sand mine and extorted and all that, none of them did prison time. They were all given probation, fines, community service, things like that, right? That just goes to show you in Nevada, how different things are. You could charge five men total with the same crime. You can give one 10 to 15 years for it and you can give all of the other ones community service. That's exactly what happened here. You take away the death of Teddy Binion and Rick Tavish is serving at least 10 years in prison for the other two happenings, the incidents. The men involved with him did not go to prison at all. Gotta love Las Vegas. So Rick and Sandy are off to prison. But what's it gonna be like for Rick? Is he gonna have any issues? Is he gonna get jumped for being on the news? Is he gonna have any problems? No. I mean, it's not like he did any bad charges. I mean, everybody in prison would have gone after that silver vault for sure. Nobody in prison cares if you did or did not take a man's life. It is what it is, it's part of the game. Half the prison has taken somebody's life. Now, more than likely, he went to high desert get stuck in the fish tank. Because he's high profile, he's probably in the fish tank for two months. He's locked down 24 hours a day. You don't get out every three days or so. They'll, they'll let you go shower with your celly and that's it. You're fishing for anything you can get. I mean, it's, it's all bad. No books, no nothing. It's the worst. Then I'm sure they moved him over to level four while they were moving him down levels, right? You have to do X amount of time in each level and work your way down. I'm sure he was just fine then too. Now he had to probably come in, definitely he had to come in, show his paperwork to everybody, say this is why I'm here. Everybody meet Rick. He's gonna be here for a while. Let's all get to know him. Now was he or was he not a part of any white group in prison? 
Well, he was definitely a wood. Doing that much time, you're gonna be a wood. I don't believe he was ever an A-dub or wanted to be an A-dub or any of that. From what I hear, he was the clerk at the prison. Now, the clerk is a very coveted job and it's a very important job. So immediately once he gets that job, the other white inmates or the woods are going to protect him like, like he's the kingdom. This is because he has access to the internet. You give him a name of somebody who just comes into prison, he can look them up and find out if they have any bad charges or if they're okay to walk the yard. Now you multiply that and he starts running every name of everybody in the white car in that prison. He's an important person now. So whether or not he, he didn't have to join anybody and he didn't have to be protected per se. It's just well known. That's our dude. Nobody's gonna have a problem with him. You go ahead and let him do his job. Leave him the hell alone. Now this all came out when Michael Kennedy, a well-known Aryan warrior, decided he was gonna turn on all of his A-dub friends. He got on the stand and he told this lavish tale about how Rick was under his wing and ran everybody's name on the yard. Why you gotta do Rick like that, Mike? That's what I wanna know. You have a beef with your homies and you shit on them. You don't just bring this dude who's over here just trying to do his time in for a crime he feels he shouldn't be there for. And now you just took his job from him and probably got him moved off the compound, which is more than likely what happened. I know Rick was at Southern Desert. I know he was in Ely and I know he was in High Desert. I'm gonna say he probably got shipped to Ely when Mike Kennedy got on the stand and said that Rick was running names in the office. 2004. Nevada Supreme Court. Nevada Supreme Court, they decide, hey, they need to be retried on the murder phase of this case. Basically, they're upholding the thefts, but the murder, that's a little sketchy. They need to be retried in Clark County. This is the first win that has come along for them. They have been convicted. They have been locked away for four years. Finally, the biggest portion of their sentence, they're going to get a second shot at giving that time back to the state. Now, Rick wasn't taking any chances. Rick comes from a family that is well-to-do. We'll just say that. Well, they went out and they got him the best lawyer that they could find. And I'm not talking the best Las Vegas lawyer. I'm talking top 10 in the nation lawyer. They go and they get none other than San Francisco attorney, Tony Serra. Now, Tony Serra has, he's gotten acquittals for Black Panthers. He's gotten acquittals for Hells Angels. This dude is like the hippie guru lawyer. Really weird looking dude teeth all jacked up, but he's really good at his job. That's who is going to be the attorney for Rick in this second trial. Now, Tony Serra comes in and he says, hey, look, your attorneys did an okay job, but they didn't give the jury any type of alternate way that Teddy Binion had gone to the upper room. They didn't pound it into their head. You have to say, hey, it didn't happen like this. It happened like this. They were too defensive and not not enough offense, basically. Now to do this, he basically had to destroy the legacy of Teddy Binion. He had to paint him as this out of control junkie. He had experts come in and tell about the potency of different H's that come from Mexico, saying, hey, you could get a batch that's this big and a batch that's this big, and this one will send you to the upper room and this one won't even bother you at all, which is true. Now, they also told the pair, hey, tone down the smiling. Obviously, they know the weight of everything because they've already been convicted and sent to prison. They know, hey, this ain't no laughing matter no more. This is our lives we're fighting for. Now, this time, it ends differently for the pair. Rick and Sandy are acquitted of the death of Teddy Binion. Now, the conviction on the gravel pit, that stands. The Perump Silver Vault, that still stands but the 20 to life is gone. This obviously drastically changes their lives. Now it meant that Rick would still not be eligible for another like four, five, six years to be paroled. He had to do whatever he had to do with these sentences. Now the problem was all these sentences were to run consecutive to each other, right? The time that he had in was on the one he was just acquitted on the second trial. They didn't give him that time and credit it towards the next consecutive sentence. Basically, Rick 
four years after, five years after being convicted, had to go back and start day one on his new sentence. Now, I don't know what kind of garbage that is, and I'm sure that there's some sort of lawsuit for him to be falsely imprisoned for four or five years and not get the credit because he would almost basically be eligible for parole immediately had they just credited the years that he's already spent, but they didn't. That's insane. A seven years dead time. He has literally sat in prison. He's, he's gotten almost half of the life sentence done. They take that life sentence away. No, nah, bro, you're not getting that time. No, we're not letting you go. Now you're gonna start the extortion sentence. That should be illegal right there. The NDOC and the DA's office and this Nevada Supreme Court, you guys are all, that is the most insane thing I've ever heard what but it's not all bad rick knows now he has an out date and it's within the next decade he knows it's probably within the next five or six years for the second time he has stood trial only this time when he heads back to high desert he's got that feeling only five more years i'm halfway home that's a huge win so i'm sure that he probably felt some type of way about that time being taken from him basically and just free time, go fuck yourself time. But you know he had to feel like, I, I have less time to do than I've already done. I can do this. April 2010, Nevada Department of Corrections. Rick is finally released from the custody of a Nevada prison. After 10 years of hell, this man finally is free. So they ship him up to Montana. He gets interstate compact immediately. Uh, he has to live with his parents, whatever, while he tries to get his life back together, which it doesn't take him very long to do at all. Now, former district attorney David Roger was asked about this case and how they lost the second trial. Here's what he had to say. This was a big, big case in Clark County. It had it all, sex, dope, betrayal, hidden treasure. Now the problem here, David Roger, those are people's lives. Like this might be a game or a headline to you, but you literally convicted two people that did not do this. And it didn't matter because it's a headline. It's look at what I did. Look at this crazy case that I got convictions on. I mean, I'm sure you've put away a lot of bad people that deserved it, but what about the people that didn't deserve it? Mm. Now in 2011, he stepped down as DA, but not before sending Rick and Sandy away in the first trial, not before sending OJ away. Although OJ got convicted of robbery and got nine to 33 years, although he was the only unarmed person in the room at the time. I mean, figure that out. That's the kind of games that David Roger plays. Everybody involved in that case, but one person, they all took plea deals. None of them went away. They're the ones who were armed. OJ was not armed. OJ got nine to 33 years. He did every bit of that nine years before he got parole. You know why? Because David Rogers said so. I'm coming for you, OJ. I don't care about the outside noise. I want the headlines. I want the legacy. David Roger, badass DA, takes down everybody. This guy's the goat though. He's the goat of turning lemons into champagne. He's the biggest idiot whisperer I've ever met. Who's really the bad person in this story though? You can't say it's the Binion family. Of course they did what they did. That's what rich families do. You can't blame Rick and Sandy for going out there and trying to take the silver. Of course they did. That's what anybody's gonna do. You can't blame Ted Binion. He's just a wild card. The dude was just out there living on the edge. But you can blame David Roger. He's the one who really ruined lives in this. Now, sadly, John Momet passed away at the age of 74 after fighting his battle with lung cancer. There might not ever be another one like him. Now, Sandy moved after the acquittal, obviously. She's remarried. I'm not gonna say her real name or where she's at, but she has part ownership in an art gallery with her new now husband. And I'm sure she's just trying to wash this whole thing away. You know, she's probably tired of hearing it. We're talking, 25 years of her listening to this is probably very old. She is going after the state of Nevada for the wrongful conviction 
and false imprisonment, basically. From what I see, she's only suing for $150,000. Now, I want her to get every penny of that, and I wish that she was able to get more. And you keep killing it out there, Sandy, and there's no pun intended in that whatsoever. You keep doing good in life. You're obviously successful at what you do, and I hear that you're very good at what you do. Blessings and prayers to you and your new family. Now, she is trying steadily to get the Nevada Supreme Court to hear her case on the Pahrump charges. Those were the other charges she was convicted of. Obviously, the sand mine had nothing to do with her. The problem is, is they're using her calling Rick four times while he was out there in Pahrump. But she could have been calling him for anything. She may have known. She may not have. Is four phone calls not answered on his cell phone enough to convict her of this? Or should those charges be overturned also? I think it should be heard. I think she should have a real shot at going up there and fighting that case again. You know, it got all blurred. It got all blurred because of Teddy Binion being sent to the upper room. So that's all people see. Forget these charges, they're nothing. Of course, the silver charges are nothing compared to the death charges. Now you take that death away, it's a different story. And now you're just focused on the silver charges. And she can win that case, but they won't let her. Now, like I said, Rick, he went to Montana. He started working, started building buildings, you know, man's work. He got off parole, no problem. He doesn't owe anybody anything. Like I said in the beginning of this, he is building a $1.9 billion crypto mining facility in North Dakota right now. His company, FX Solutions, is doing amazing state-of-the-art things and in record time. And he's overseeing all of it. And he's also done this while a company that he was representing was charged for Ponzi schemes of $722 million. Now, obviously, Rick had nothing to do with this, and Rick was probably the first one that they'd really dug into to look to make sure that he had nothing to do with this. But he's left basically to pick up the pieces of this company, and he did it. And he got the contract for the $1.9 million or billion dollar facility. You do you, Rick. You're killing it, bro. I wish nothing but the best for you. He is now married. He has children. He's finally living his life after over a decade of hell, after being called a killer. Now he's out there, he's got his, his boots on, he's doing good. What do you guys think? Do you think Rick and Sandy actually took Teddy Benyon out? I don't. I don't believe that for one minute. Is there treasure? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now don't go and get caught. There's one guy, he's been caught like two times with a shovel digging in the ground. Don't be that guy. If you just bought that, that plot, of land, you better be out there just digging it up like it's a sand mine itself. That's what I'd be doing. I'd be buying tractors, but I believe there's treasure out there for sure. Thank you for coming to Vegas Profile Stories. I appreciate each and every one of you. I hope you guys have an amazing day and I'll see you next time.